Let's take a look at a couple of examples involving improper integrals with infinite limits of integration. So in this case we have the integral from negative infinity to negative 1 of the function x times e to the negative x squared. Now as we integrate this we know that we're going to need to do the indefinite integral of x e to the negative x squared and then we'll have to deal with the improper integral and the limits of integration. So let's separate those two problems and let's do the integral off to the side so that we can do that on its own without mixing it with the other problem of dealing with the limits of integration. So let me just do the indefinite integral by itself over here. And for this we're going to need u substitution. Where u equals negative x squared and du then equals negative 2x dx which means that we'll have e to the u and then the rest of it is x times dx. So this negative 2 doesn't appear anywhere. So to deal with that we'll divide that on both sides and write negative 1 half du equals x dx. Just to smooth the substitution process. So when we substitute we'll have negative 1 half e to the u du which integrates nicely to just be negative one-half e to the u plus c, but we know we're going to do a definite integral a little bit later, so we can leave off the plus c. And our answer is just negative one-half e to the negative x squared. We could check this by differentiating if we wanted to, but that's the correct answer for the indefinite integral portion. So now we can turn our attention to the problem at hand, which is the infinite limits of integration specifically the negative infinity as the lower limit of integration. So we have an interval of integration that's infinite, which means we're dealing with an improper integral, and we need to use a limit and replace that infinite lower bound with t. Then we'll take a limit as t approaches negative infinity. We've already done the next step, which is to take the antiderivative. So we know that this will equal the limit as t approaches negative infinity of negative one-half e to the negative x squared evaluated from t to negative one. So now we simply plug in the limits of integration and then we'll have one more step to do evaluating this limit as t approaches negative infinity. So when we plug in negative one we get negative one-half e to the negative negative one squared and then minus negative one-half so plus one-half e to the negative t squared. Now to evaluate this limit as t approaches negative infinity it may be helpful to rewrite this a little bit so that it's clearer what's happening as t increases. Let me rewrite these using positive exponents. So this first term will turn into negative 1 over 2 times e to the first power. And for the second term, that e to the negative t squared will similarly move to the denominator and become e to the positive t squared. And now maybe it's easier to see what happens as we plug in larger and larger negative values of t. So as t approaches negative infinity, think about what happens. t squared is going to approach positive infinity because we're plugging in larger and larger negative numbers and every time we square them they get larger and larger but positive. Then if you raise e to those large positive answers you're also going to get large positive numbers so those are trending toward infinity as well. And since you have a denominator that's trending toward infinity and a constant numerator, that means you're dividing one by larger and larger, infinitely larger numbers, meaning that's getting infinitely smaller. So this all goes to zero. So this is the sort of limit that you should be able to evaluate, even if it's been a little while since you've done these in Calc 1, 
you should remember enough to be able to do simple limits like this to work out these improper integral problems. If you need to, you can play with the calculator for a little while and see if you can build the intuition of plugging in larger and larger positive or negative values as needed. But the answer to this just works out to negative 1 over 2e as the final answer. So this one is convergent and it specifically converges to the value negative 1 over 2e since the second half goes to 0. Now let's try a similar example. The same function but instead of the limits of integration being from negative infinity to 1, now the bounds go from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now let's think carefully about this. We have two infinite bounds and so one limit won't be enough. Simply doing the limit as t approaches negative infinity or as t approaches infinity won't be enough because we need to deal with both infinite bounds. So see if you can figure out what we're going to do to deal with that. And you can pause the video and see if you can work out what our approach will be. It turns out if we have these two infinite bounds, we can separate this integral. We can split it anywhere between negative infinity and infinity. Because if we're integrating a function from one point to another, we can stop partway between at some intermediate value. We can find the area from A to C and then find the area from C to B and that'll be the same as the total area from A to B. So you can take an integral that's defining an area or some other application and you can stop partway through and split this into two integrals wherever you choose to do so. So we'll pick something easy and we'll take zero as our dividing point but we could take the integral from negative infinity to negative 100 and then from negative 100 to infinity or from negative infinity to 5 and then from 5 to infinity. Whatever we want to do we can split anywhere between negative infinity and infinity. It just turns out we'll use an easy number like 0. So we'll rewrite this as the integral from negative infinity to 0 of our function plus the integral from 0 to infinity. And again the reason we do this is now each integral only has one infinite bound and thus can be handled with one limit. So on the first one we'll take a limit as t approaches negative infinity and replace the lower bound with t. And on the second integral we'll take the limit as t approaches positive infinity and replace the upper bound with t. And now you can work out the rest of it just like the last example we did. I won't take the time to go through it, but it turns out that if you do this, both of these integrals turn out to be zero because the area below and the area above the x-axis cancel each other out in both cases. So it turns out that if you work out the details, you should get zero for your answer. So this again is a convergent improper integral and it converges to zero. So if you're curious, you can take a moment and work that out on your own. We've already worked through the indefinite integral and seen an example just like this. So you can try working this one out and seeing if you get zero at the end. So those two examples, again, illustrate what to do when you have infinite bounds on an integral.